Hello, Dark Reader, and welcome to the Dark Side of the Library podcast. I'm your host, Katie. Today on this mini-sode, we will be talking about the last tale of the Flower Bride. This is by Roshani Chakshi. I am very excited to talk to you about this. Before that, I'm just going to have a tiny spiel. Go ahead and check us out over on YouTube if you are listening on our, over on our podcast and vice versa. And join us on our socials on Facebook, Instagram, etc. at Dark Side of the Library and our Amazon Live Shop. If there are dark reads you are looking for, check out our show notes at darksideofthelibrary.com. We have a lot of cool books, especially this year, that are coming out, and this is one of them. So let me tell you about the summary of the story first and why... I was drawn into this, and we'll talk about Roshani, and then further my thoughts on the book. So here's the summary. We have a story about a marriage that's unraveled by dark secrets, a friendship that is cursed in tragedy, and the danger of believing in fairy tales. We begin with a man who's the bridegroom. He falls in love and sees. He's a he's a scholar of myths. He finds this woman named Indigo Maxwell Castaneda. She's beautiful. And she kind of lures him in. And they happen to get married. But the one promise she asks of him is that he does not dig into her past. That's it. Everything else, fair game. Whatever. But the thing is, Indigo has an aunt, an estranged aunt, who's dying. And she has to go back to her childhood home called the House of Dreams. So when they arrive there, the husband eventually, over time, cannot resist. He has to dig into her past because there's this shadow that is just lurking in the halls of this dusty, old manor. And that shadow is Azur, who was once Indigo's childhood best friend, inseparable. The house is slowly revealing secrets about his wife, and eventually, he has to choose whether or not to basically damage his marriage or ruin it or their entire lives. Like, it might be deathly. There's a lot of this haunting atmospheric vibes like Mexican Gothic. So as you can see, with the summary in mind, it was very difficult for me not to want to pick this up. I hadn't heard of our author before, Roshani Chakshi, because she usually writes children's novels, and mid-grade level, and this is her adult debut novel, and thumbs up to her. It is excellent. So she's won a lot of awards. She's been nominated for a lot of things as well, but this one I'm excited to see, like, her future now for adult novels because this one I feel like is a success. I would not be surprised if it might win an award as well. Some of the mid-grade level series that she's written before I continue forward. So we have The Star-Touched Queen, The Gilded Wolves, and Aru Shah and The End of Time. So I've not read either of any of those series, but now I'm very curious. All right, so here are some of my thoughts about the book. First of all, just up front, I give this a 4 out of 5. Surprise! I was actually quite surprised. I did not think I was going to rate this that high, but I did. I really enjoyed it. So, and in addition to that, I read, okay, I listened to the audiobook. I always say I read the audiobook. That's not how that works. So, I listened to the audiobook, and some criticisms that I have read um, on Goodreads and some other reviews is that the book itself, when you're just reading through it, it can be very difficult to distinguish the two narrators that are presented and the writing style, which I actually love, um, it models down the story. So here I here are my thoughts about that. I think the audiobook, because we have two narrators, we have our bridegroom, which is I I recognized his voice right away because he's from the Atlas Six as well. So his name is Steve West. But he has a very distinguished, like, his voice is just very distinct. I know who it is. And um, I thought it was perfect for this book. It's really sensual and luxurious and just, I don't know how else to explain it. And then we have Azur, who's our other narrator. And I can see, because they're both so much about, they're talking about Indigo and her, I can see how the language that they use is very similar because it's kind of floaty and poetic, dreamy, flowery. Um, so I can definitely see that. I, I do recommend the audiobook. Now, I've talked about we have our two characters. 
the book goes, it, it flip-flops between our two, the bridegroom and Azur, and it is a bit of a chronological order. So we start with like how they both meet Indigo, and then it begins to converge into our giant pinnacle plot uh, twist time, you know, like all of the stuff about Indigo, the secrets of Indigo. I really enjoyed the two converging points and the escalation over the course of this of the novel personally and I didn't have any confusion with the flip-flopping between the two narrations that's just me so let me just tell you briefly about each character the bridegroom himself he has a few things that I was like where are we we're, we're missing some stuff so he I felt like wasn't really he's like a side character but it, it was like he was speaking like a side character speaking about the main characters I hope that makes sense Maybe it doesn't. I You don't really know much except for, like, he clearly loves his wife. Um, He falls madly lusting, loves her almost initially. He's definitely a scholar of myths and stories, literature, and that's thrown throughout the story. Lots of metaphors and analogies towards um, Indigo and her, just how her presence is almost like a creature in mythology, especially like a siren is definitely one that they, they bring up a lot, or just like any of the watery mermaid characters, harpy, like just any of those watery creatures from Greek mythology, sometimes the fey folk, etc. But the, the groom, the bridegroom is not, he's, he's not the main character. So really the, the story like the big stories are about Azure and Indigo, even though our summary is about like the bridegroom revealing her secrets. Oh no. But Azure giving the bridegroom all of these hints, etc., is uh, really more about what the story is about. So our two ladies, Azure and Indigo, I think are relatable for everybody. So I think we either know or we are or can emulate or have been like Azure or Indigo. So Azure is, she's, so she's in a shitty situation at home. And she definitely finds some safety in Indigo over time. Azure is one of those characters where she, like, they have this really strong bond um, it's very prevalent and very genuine and honest. But Azure is like the the grateful one. So because she comes from a different home and she's entering somebody else's house, she can see the benefits that Indigo doesn't necessarily see. So she's always more grateful, like to her aunt Hippolyta. Um, she's about like the house itself. She's always like you know, touching the walls and, like, assuring the house itself, the house of dreams. And Indigo just kind of goes through this with no care. She doesn't really think about everybody else because it's, like, it's hers. She has, like, an established ownership of it. Azur also is one of those characters where she wants to, like, hide. She doesn't want to be spot she doesn't want to have the spotlight on her necessarily she doesn't want people to like look at her whereas indigo i think is comfortable in the spotlight and she isn't like she's not the character where she's like going out of her way to be in the spotlight she's just very cool you know chill about it and she has no care in the world so if people look at her like oh, wow, she's super weird, and, you know, I don't know about her. Like, she'll just take that, whatever, you know, I don't care. So we have our two characters there, and I really liked the dynamic they had with each other. It wasn't healthy, by the way. So I just really enjoyed with our characters Azure and Indigo. There's a lot of codependency, and it's a very toxic relationship that they have. But at the same time, I couldn't tell you if Azure or Indigo would be better off without each other. You know what I mean? It's a weird dynamic how, you know, you can see it and be like, I don't think this is right. 
But if Azura didn't have Indigo, would she be in a better place? And vice versa. And this is another thing, too, I want to mention. With Indigo specifically, I think a lot of people would be like, Indigo is just puppeteering everybody, including Azura. But over time in this novel, you realize that that code of... There's a reason why it's called being codependent on each other. So you see why Indigo needs Azura so bad and that how both of them share that toxic trait with each other and they're so stuck and bound with each other. It's really interesting and I really liked that dynamic. It was really fun. And not only that, with the atmosphere that we had in the novel, this really surreal kind of haunting looming background was really interesting because it never was blatantly freaky or horrifying. You just felt like something was a little off. You know, it wasn't just their dynamic that was like, hmm, questionable, but it was the that the house, her aunt, Hippolyta, um, just like how things would be, how things progressed, just a little off to make you uncomfortable but not like I never got like the goosebumps on my skin but it's really hard for me to get like any super creep factor I think I would have liked it if the book did amplify that creep factor a little bit but here's why I I didn't mind it so much there's such a connection with the fae folk in this book that I liked what they did Because the fey folk, to me, in my opinion, they're not demons, they're not scary, and they're not in your face either. I think you can say that the fey folk love to hide in plain sight, and I think that's the whole point of this book, is that we have a lot of things in their atmosphere that are just slightly off, and you're not really sure, well, maybe it's just a weird, maybe it's just weird, and that's what it is. Or maybe it's actually, like, horrible, you know? So I like that because there is that connection with the fae folk. Things are camouflaged all the time. We have this really dreamy, surreal state throughout this book. And it really flows well with the theme of being associated with the fae folk. In fact, Azura and Indigo are convinced that they need to show the fae folk or they're always being tested by the fae folk because... They think they are associated with the fae folk or they they are fae. They are magical um, in some way or they, you know, they need to pass a certain amount of tests to be a part of like this mystical realm. So you kind of get lost sometimes in the narrative because it's, I at least did because I felt like I wasn't sure, are we in (laughs) reality or are they? in the house of dreams and we're in another realm entirely so i loved that and i loved the how that part was enhanced with the associations of mythology there's a lot of greek specifically myths that were thrown around you would even see connections with like certain characters and how they related to each other and what came of them that are very similar to some Greek stories as well. And I liked that. And it was, you know, even though they say what story it is, and they're just making, you know, there's no guessing here. I really liked how the author slipped those myths in there. It's not just primarily Greek. And this is another thing I appreciate. There are myths from other places around the world that were kind of placed in there. Like an example is they used a... Um, Philippine goddess myth and just threw that in there which is really cool now I want to learn more about this goddess that I never knew about so I really appreciated that I think this is a book that I was I've been kind of looking for I wanted something that was more on the fantasy spectrum I wanted something with the fae but I've noticed there's been a few new releases that have had pretty low reviews Um, I wanted something that was definitely mystical but dark and kind of haunting, unnerving. And I think that this story did a pretty good job. You know, there were times where I felt like the plot might have gotten muddled. I don't think it necessarily needed to have this very direct plot. It got there, 
even though it was kind of predictable, we got to a place and I think it was more focusing on just the relationships between all of the characters and ultimately um, Indigo, who could be a representation of something magical, something we don't understand, you know, so um, and something of myth. I really enjoyed that. It was more of a contemporary folktale. It was very cool. So I personally give this book a four out of five. And if you are looking for something kind of like this, more magical, gothic, horror-ish, not horror, but also romantic, it was very sensual. It was just, I don't know, luxurious. It was just a lot. It was just like eating like chocolate mousse or something. I don't know. It was just, but it was perfect perfect chocolate mousse and it was just very satisfying so check this one out this is the last tale of the flower bride i do recommend it plus the cover is gorgeous also make sure to check out roshani chokshi's other books and let me know what you think of them you can do that over on our socials on instagram facebook youtube so right here or on our uh on your favorite listening app so rate and review wherever you're at if you do like dark reads make sure to give us a follow thumbs up and let us know what kind of reads you're looking for and if you are looking for stuff check out our show notes i check them out all the time because there's just so many that are released and i'll forget it's there's just too many to keep track of so go ahead check those out as well at darksideofthelibrary.com We like to publish every Wednesday and Friday, so stay tuned on those days. And we'd be super happy if you could spread this podcast to your other friends, family, loved ones, anyone who would like a dark, gothic, horror read, uh, make sure to send them our way. Thanks so much for listening. We will see you next time.